right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, as we continue our journey through the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. And uh, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before your throne this morning thanking you for life, the physical life that allows me to come into this building because of the spiritual life you've given me through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, and, and in the Holy Spirit, I ask you to take over this portion of our service. Just take it over, because all I can do is preach it to the ears. You must take it from there to the heart, and only you can. And so I pray that that would be the case today, that we would open up our hearts and our minds to your truth so that we can go out of here as faithful ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ, living lives that honor, exalt, and glorify the Father and Son as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Bless our time together today, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I go any further, some of you old-timers old, old know Jeff Albright's sister, Wanda, passed away this week. I'll be doing the funeral in Carmine tomorrow. Uh, you old timers, you know Jeff. If you get a chance today, maybe shoot him a text, tell him you love him, you're praying for the family. Uh, and then pray for me as I do the funeral tomorrow at noon in Carmi. We're going to get started today, and we're going to finish up a section of Paul's letter in which Paul was trying to drive home a, a truth that he began in Ephesians 5.21 when he said, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ or in the reverence of Christ. Be subject to one another. And that, and that word subject, I'm going to define it one last time because it's important that we understand it the way the Word of God means it. A, a subject is defined, it's a, originally a military term, meaning to rank themselves. It's something we do ourselves under one another. You know, in the armed forces, I, I was in the Navy, you didn't buck the guy that was above you or you'd end up in the brig. And so whoever your immediate higher ranked person was, you obeyed him. And, uh, and John MacArthur says of this, he says the main idea of this subjecting ourselves is that of relinquishing one's right to another person. But in all interpersonal relationship, there's only to be mutual submission Submission is a general spiritual attitude that is to be of every believer in all relationships. In other words, what Philippians 2.3 says, make others more important than yourself. We ought to have a mindset as believers to serve others, to make others more important than ourselves. It's what our Lord Jesus did when he left heaven and came to this earth, and it should be how we operate in our life. Uh, and Paul then launched from that one verse, that one line, to begin to talk about how in this subjection, in this submission, in this servant-oriented kind of concept, not only is it a one to another, but it's wives to husbands. We looked at that last week, right? Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, right? And then we also, uh, in, a few weeks ago, we looked at children to their parents. I'm, I'm not going to teach that again because I taught it on Mother's Day and Father's Day. And if you want that, you can get it uh, through our uh, tape system or however it works back there. But now Paul is going to address one more group about this whole concept of subjecting. And we're going to find it in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. And so I just want to read that this morning as a whole, and then we'll break it down. So Paul has addressed what? How we should be to one another. I should serve you and you should serve me and it has nothing to do with our rank in the church. You don't serve me because I'm pastor and I don't serve you because you're whoever you are. It should be the mutual understanding that we serve one another, okay? And then he went on to husbands and wives. Then he went on in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, the, about children obeying their parents. And now he's going to cover one more group. So when you see the word slave and master this morning, I want you to think employer and employee. We don't have slaves and we don't call people masters, okay? So think of it in terms of the workplace. So let's read. Slaves, what's that? What are we going to put there? Employees. Employees. Slaves be obedient to those who are your masters. Who are those? 
employers, whoever's over you in, in the job you have, according to the flesh. That flesh there is not sinful flesh, it's just human flesh. Uh, and, and we should be obedient to those who are masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. There's that phrase again, as to Christ, right? Are all bosses good people? Can some of them be really mean? Are we to submit to them? Because even if we can't see, even if we can't see any good in them, the way we're going to be able to do it, go back one verse. Oh, no, that's the verse. As to Christ. That always frees us to be obedient to that master, that employer, that supervisor, that manager. Even if they're not good people, we can do it for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. So let's go on. Verse 6. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters... Do the same things to them. This is important. If you're a manager here, supervisor, uh, owner, listen to this. This one verse is for you. And masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Holy Spirit, bless the reading of God's word. We're going to look at first the slave or the employee, and we're going to see the following truths. Three things, subpoints to this first point. The responsibility of the servant towards the master is this. Number one, there's a call to obedience. There's a call to obedience. Secondly, the motive for carrying out this obedience. So the call to it, then the motive for it, and, and third, the reward that follows, that follows this call to obedience and when we obey. And then for the masters, we're going to see two subpoints, And that's going to be the motive for how a master slash boss is to lead. What's the motive for how we lead in a certain way? And then secondly, Paul gives a warning about threatening those that are under you. So let's look at this. We'll go with the servant first. The first thing we see in this text is that Paul is giving a call to obedience. In verse 5 he says, slaves, or in our case it would be what? Employees, right? Be obedient. How many of you have someone in your head right now? Can you have the courage to raise your hand? Okay, four of you are honest, five? Okay. Slaves slash employees, be obedient to those who are your masters, manager, supervisor, owner, according to the flesh. In other words, if I worked someplace under Andy or Chris or somebody, when I go to work on Monday morning, I'm, I'm not the pastor there, I'm a worker. And I'm going to submit myself to their leadership. It doesn't matter that in the church I'm a pastor. When I go to work on Monday morning, I, 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 I'm a servant and I'm going to serve. And I'm going to do as I'm told as long as it doesn't conflict with the will and purpose of God. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. That word flesh there is not sinful flesh, it's just human flesh. And how are we to be obedient? With fear and trembling. In the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Friends, believers, employees, whatever you want to call them, are called to not only obey simply when they desire to, when their employers are fair and reasonable. Listen, like wives to husbands, they are to obey in everything and at all times. I've told you often, you want to change how you view your job, that job you go to on Monday morning you begrudgingly, hating it, and, and I just, man, I, I despise going in here. I hate what I do. 
I can flip that in a second for you if you're a believer. You ready? You want it flipped? It's your mission field. Quit seeing it as just work. It's your mission field. There are people that are lost and headed to hell, and it might be your boss, and God has strategically placed you at that place of employment to let your light shine so that through your good works, they might glorify God in their day of visitation. You have an ambassador's role in the marketplace where you work. And you're called to obey, not in some things. If I were to ask you to raise your hand, and please don't, how many, don't do this, how many of you think you're smarter than your boss? I'll bet all kinds of hands, that, and you might be right. That boss might have sucked up and got it because someone knew his uncle and gave him the position and you deserve it and, and, and you worked hard and it's unfair and you were passed over and now I got to go to work preacher and you're telling me to obey that guy? Yeah. Yes. That's exactly what I'm telling you. And it's not me telling you, it's the Lord telling you. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. And by the way, that could be a man or woman in the marketplace. I don't know who's over you, but men, if it's a woman, you submit to her leadership in the marketplace. You understand that? And you're to do it with fear and trembling. Why? Because you're scared of the boss? Nope. Why do we have that fear and trembling? Where's that coming from? What's the motive for that? Our master in heaven. We answer to him. Amen? We answer to him. There are far too many people that profess Christ live in lives of disobedience in the marketplace and they wonder why their lives aren't blessed. I mean, I hear people all the time whining and moaning and groaning about their jobs and the people over them. Listen, I, by the way, lest you think I never did anything but preach, you know, once a week on Sunday and then I just, you know, sit at home in my recliner and watch soap operas all week. By the way, did you know you can miss a soap opera for 10 years, come back, and they're just on the next scene? I worked in factories. I worked in a Fruit of the Loom plant that was in Campbellsville, Kentucky. It's not there anymore. They've since removed it. But I was in what they called the pocket division. You know those T-shirts you wear that got the pocket? I might have pressed that pocket. <laughs> Ask me if I love going in. There was a little hot plate that first night, I'll never forget. And, and, and the ladies would, would put these pockets with paper around them and fold it over so then you'd put it in the hot plate, which would, the, the, the idea of that is that that hot plate would smooth it out so then the ladies would get it back and then sew it on the shirt. That hot plate was a couple hundred degrees. That first night I burnt myself so many times trying to pick that pocket out of that machine, I thought, I'm quitting. This sucks. Uh, I'm not doing this. And I don't even think I'll be able to do it. You know, what? they've lost their mind putting me here. Don't they know who I am? And, and the guy I was working with was chuckling. He said, listen, we've all started there. We all thought what you're thinking, you'll get it. Sure enough, months later, I was doing hundreds and hundreds of pockets a night. I learned how to use my elbows to make that come down and I was able to scoop that out, put it, and you could daydream the night away and I, I, it'd be three hours. I wouldn't even know three hours passed by and I got stacks and stacks of, of these pockets ready to roll and I got better as I went and, and a, a, after a certain amount of time, they, they asked me to supervise my shift of, of people. I was a college kid, but they asked me to supervise my shift of people and I learned quick that the way to make my group work well is to treat them well. Amen. And I learned a valuable leadership lesson. I never asked them to do anything that I wasn't willing to do. Amen. Did you know that's true of our Lord? There's not a thing he's asked you to do as his follower that he didn't demonstrate in his earthly life before he left heaven. So when we moan and groan and mumble and fumble about Understand this, Jesus is not asking anything out of you that he hasn't done himself. We're to obey. 
And listen, let me tell you why you struggle. It's not really that you think your boss is a loser. You might think that. It might, you know, just you got passed over, whatever the case may be. Your real issue of subjecting yourself to anyone else is your flesh. And the flesh I'm referring to now is your sinful flesh. We don't want anyone or anything to govern us. We don't like any boss. We don't like anybody telling us what to do. All of us within our human sinful flesh, we despise being told what to do. That's the real struggle. And how are we going to obey another fallen guy with his flaws and faults unless we look beyond that guy and we say in the sincerity of your heart, as to Christ. First Peter 2, if you read the letter that uh, Peter wrote, uh, first, Peter, first Peter, it's a letter written to people that are under persecution. They're, they were being attacked every which way. And Peter says to them in the second chapter, beginning verse 13, going through 19, now remember, these, guys, these Christians are under severe attack because of their faith. And here's what he says. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or president, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. I think we've inverted that in America somewhat. For such is the will of God. What is the will of God? That we submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. See, that these Christians under attack were being lied about. And they were being uh, 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 misrepresented. And, and Peter is telling them, if you want to walk well with the Lord and shut up these people, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Because what these people were saying about these Christians in First Peter is that they weren't following the king, they were following another king, which is true. But Peter's now saying, listen, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Verse uh, 16, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. And by the way, the kings of that day were horrible people. Horrible people. And yet, what does he say? What does the Holy Spirit through Peter say? Honor all people. Not just saved, honor all people. Treat all well. Love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Servants. Be submissive to your masters with all respect. Again, employee, supervisor, manager, owner. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. How many of us have had unreasonable supervisors in our life who have treated us poorly? And then when they find out we're believers, they even treat us more poorly than they did before. But how are we to respond to that kind of treatment? In verse 18, we're told, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows and suffers unjustly. We don't live for our job. We live for our Lord in the job that we have. So what's the motive for obedience? There better be a good motive if I'm gonna follow the leadership of people I don't respect. Look at verses uh, five, six, and seven of our text. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. So when you go back to work tomorrow and that boss is a jerk or he's not good or she's not good and they're mean and they're hateful and, and, they're, and they're not treating you as you should be treated, you need to see past them to Christ. So when they ask you to do what you don't want to do and they're unfair and they're asking because they've asked you and they haven't asked that other person 22 times because they like that person and they don't like you and they ask you to sweep the floor, you're going to do it with joy. You're going to do it with a smile on your face. Because you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for Jesus. Amen? Amen? 
And if Jesus was your supervisor, would you sweep the floor well? You'd sweep it like you never swept it before. Amen? So whatever it is, those menial tasks they ask out of you that you don't like, as to Christ, look at verse 6, not by way of eye services, men pleasers. In other words, eye service, when they're around you, you'll do right because you want that promotion. But when they leave, you sit there and, and attack them. No, 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 we're, gonna, we're not going to do that as Christians. We're going to do what we do as slaves of Christ. Look at verse 6, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And what is the will of God from the heart in this scene? Obeying those that are over you in the marketplace. And if you're a manager, or supervisor, or owner, you can make it a lot easier for those people to do that if you treat them well, but we'll get into that in a second. Look at verse 7. With good will render service. You ready? You need to underline this, underscore it. So if you're struggling at work, with good will render service. Uh, by the way, student, t- it, you're a servant. Teachers, you're a, a, a master. With, uh, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men. Did you see it? Verse 5, as to Christ. Verse 6, you're not going to do it as men please, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Verse 7, with good will. You think he's driving it home? We don't do what we do when we go to work for the sake of work. We don't do it for promotions. We don't do it uh, so that people talk uh, good about us. We do it unto Christ. We are on this earth. We exist as believers for one reason, and it's to, so that we will exalt Christ in everything we say and everything we do. John MacArthur says this. He says, a Christian's primary concern about his job should be simply to do it well to the glory of God as to Christ. He, she does everything out of love for Christ, by the power of Christ, and to the glory of Christ. That's why Paul writes in Colossians 3, 17, whatever, and you ought to memorize this verse, friends, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever we do, how we operate out there matters, right? It's not just about coming to church on Sunday. It's about how are we going to live our lives on Monday? How are we going to respond to those that are over us? If you've not been doing well, you, I, if I was you, I'd go to my boss and say, you know, I've had a, I, I know you know I've had a pretty sour attitude. I want, I want to ask you to forgive me. I haven't represented my Savior well. And that's going to change starting today. And that supervisor might dump on you. He might be lost. He, she might be lost. And they don't care a bit. But you want to set the record straight and then you want to honor Christ by the way you live your life. And the third thing about our obedience, we looked at the call to obedience, we looked at the motive for obedience, as to Christ. And third, the Lord's rewards for our obedience. Look at verse 7 and 8. With goodwill render service as to the Lord and not to men. Look at verse 8. Knowing that whatever good thing each one does... This he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. God honors and blesses those that are obedient to his commands. If you're not obedient to his commands, don't sit there and act like somebody else is the issue, not the church, not the... It's you. God blesses those who serve well. Philippians 4.17 says this, Paul writing to the Philippian church, they had been uh, uh, supporting him as he was on his missionary journey. In fact, at one point, if you read a little bit above that, they were the only church doing it. And, And he tells them in this one verse, and I'll never forget this, And I used to not be very good at receiving gifts from people or or things. It it was really awkward to me. I I, I didn't know how to handle that because I wanted to be a giver, not a taker. And I wanted no one in my ministry to ever think I'm living for you to give me stuff. And then I read this. Paul says, not that I seek the gift itself. He'd been thanking them for the gift they'd sent him, a care package, if you will. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. What account? A bank account? What account's he talking about? The account that God is keeping. 
And it rocked my world when I read this. And I was like, oh my gosh, Lord, I'm refusing things. And no, 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 sometimes I need to take them, even if I don't need them, because why? Because I, but I seek the, for the profit which increases to your account. Now, that didn't mean some subvertly trying to get you to give me something this week. I'm simply saying we have to learn how to give and we have to learn how to receive the blessings of God that comes our way. And, and now I have because I understand that God himself is keeping an account. And every time you do right, something goes in that account. When you obey God, it goes in that account. When you do what God is asking you to do, when the Holy Spirit is whispering something in your heart and you've waffled before, no, 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 do it. Because in doing it, you're filling your account. Amen. Revelation twenty two twelve 12 says this. Jesus says, behold. You know, that word behold is a big word. You know what it means? It means pay attention. Behold, I am coming quickly. The I, there's Jesus. I am coming quickly. And my what? Is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. That's why there are going to be people in heaven rewarded greatly that we pass over like they're nothing. And there's going to be people we thought were something that were rewarded very little because their motives weren't pure for what they did. Our nation is under siege. We don't, we aren't going to convert people, change people with hate. You know, they hate us, we're going to hate them. No, 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 they're going to hate us, but we're going to love them. And one of the ways we're going to show our love is when we obey the ones that are over us in the flesh. And I promise you this, they're paying attention. If you start doing what I'm asking you, well, actually what the Lord is asking you to do, and you radically change the way you go to your job on Monday morning, it won't take long before that person notices the change in you. And if they come up to you and ask you, why, Trudy, have you changed so much? Then you, the door is open for you to say, I was not serving my Lord well with my attitude and my actions and I've repented and I realize that God's call on my life is to be obedient to him by being obedient to you and I'm sorry for my behavior because I didn't represent Christ well but beginning today Lord willing you're going to see a great change in my behavior my attitude and my actions and my words. The motive as to Christ. The Lord's reward, I don't know what it's going to be. You ever think, I thought of Joseph this week when I was studying this and about how, you know, Joseph had a dream, right? That his 12 brothers were going to bow to him and he told them and they liked that so much they were going to kill him, but then they decided to sell him into slavery. And down he went into Egypt, and he was, you know, uh, one thing led to another, and Potiphar's wife tried to hit on him, and he said, no way, and he took off, and then she accused him of, of uh, doing something sexual to her that he shouldn't have done. And they threw him in prison. Can you imagine... All you've done your whole life is do what God has asked you to do. And what seems to be your reward is now prison. And if he was alive in our day, he would be marked a sex offender wherever he went for the rest of his life. And I can imagine sitting in prison in that dungeon thinking, God, why? Why have, I, I, I've done what you've asked. I've served you well. I, I've, I've lived well. I've obeyed those over me. And now here I am. And then he interpreted the, the, the dreams of, the, I think, the baker and the butcher. And, and, and then the Pharaoh has a dream and no one can uh, do it. And the, they remember, hey, man, there's this dude in prison that can. And so he goes up. He tells the king everything. And what's he, he ends up number two man in Egypt. So in other words, what I'm saying is this. You might go to work tomorrow and put this into your life. I'm gonna be a changed employee. I'm gonna work differently. I'm gonna serve my bosses differently. 
I'm going to serve my fellow employees differently. But if you're doing that simply to get the reward, your motive is impure, and you'll get nothing from God. And here's the thing I thought, Lord, am I willing to do right even if my reward's not until your return? In other words, I don't see any benefit from it while I'm here on earth. And the answer has got to be yes. 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 Because I'm here for you. I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. Are you listening, church? This can radically change how you view your job. It's your mission field. You say, no, it's more of a battlefield. Okay. <laughs> that might be true, but it's still your mission field. And then finally, let's talk to those who are in charge. Right? What's the motive? How sh if you're in charge in here, I don't care what you lead. If you lead anything, the motive for how you lead is found in six, verse 9. And masters, employers, uh, managers, supervisors, teachers, principals, whatever it is you lead. Fathers in the home, husbands in the home, and masters do the same things to them. What? Serve. Jesus led with a servant's attitude. Remember when he washed the feet of the disciples and at the end he said, blessed are you if you do these things? Well, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And, and it breaks my heart the way I see some Christian supervisor slash man or whatever, and they lord it over their people. No, 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 your people, if they're interviewed, they ought to say, no, 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 my boss is, is awesome. What makes him awesome? He doesn't ask anything out of me that he won't do. I've seen him sweep a floor, so how can I not sweep a floor? I've seen him roll up his sleeves and do the work. How can I not roll up my sleeves and do the work? He encourages us. He rewards us. He blesses us. He praises us. I've often said no wife is going to lead her husband to Christ through nagging. And I, I would say this to any supervisor in this building. You will not lead anyone to better work by nagging them. Even if you threaten them. Look at what verse 9 says. And masters do the same things to them. Who's them? The employees, the slaves. And give up threatening. Give up threatening. John MacArthur says this. He says a Christian's employer's relationship to his employees should have the same motivation to go as a Christian worker's relationship to his employer the desire to obey and please the Lord. A Christian employer's first work, just as a Christian employee's first work, is to do God's will and to manifest Christ's likeness in all that they do. In other words, Colossians 3.17 is as true for the master as it is the slave. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all as unto the Lord. We're all accountable to the Lord. We're all accountable to the Lord. The warning, look at verse 9 again. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. The master should be careful to remember that both he and the servants are answerable to the Lord for how they carry out their positions. It matters. It matters, boss, what kind of boss you are. It might not matter in the plant, but I promise you it matters to God. Lead as Christ led. A Christian employer, master, should know that he is no more important or worthy than the lowest employee working for him. And I was thinking, if you own it and the custodian is there, he's as special to God as you are. Do you understand that? At the foot of the cross, the president of the company is a sinner, just like the custodian of the company is a sinner, and they both can, are there to receive the grace that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And when you get up from that position, you are equally brothers and sisters in Christ, and you are not more special because you're a supervisor, and you're not less special because you're a servant. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. 
And we ought to treat one another that way. Remember this, boss. Remember this. And give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. There might be partiality on this earth. There might be uh, people that get special stuff because of your position. But with God, with God, there's no partiality. We're all equal before him. So when you go to work tomorrow morning, if you're the employee, you're as special to God as the one that you're answering to at work. The blood was shed for you like it was shed for him or her. And we have got to change the way we do business with the world. We need to love well. We need to speak well. We need to serve well. And if we're a boss, we need to love well, speak well, serve well. As Paul says in Ephesians 4, he says, Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only that which edifies the hearer. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. Bosses, be careful about the way you speak to your employees because God is listening. And there is no partiality. That's why we can take it all the way back to verse 21 of chapter 5. When Paul says, be subject one to another in the fear of Christ. I have a boss. You have the same boss. And his name's Jesus. And if you'll study the life of Jesus on earth, you'll, you'll understand that the way he led was by serving. It's radical. That's not the way the world does it, but it's the way Jesus did it. He got on his knees and washed the disciples' feet. He hung on a cross for the sins of of those who place their faith in him. That's how he led. So if you're a boss in here today, lead well. I was thinking of you, sweetheart, this morning. Like, you're a boss of what, 18 little ones? <laughs> what do you got, 18, 19? How she handles those kids. The way she responds to those kids. The way she loves those kids. God is watching. Amen. I know God's way seems strange to our flesh. But in our spirit, surely we're rejoicing the morning that God has called me to whatever position I'm in to love well, serve well, speak well, do well. That we're going to serve one another. And by the way, that's not just to Christian bosses or Christian employees. No, no, no. I would dare say it's even more important that we do it to those that don't know Jesus. So maybe it'll be the, the very thing that draws them in the way we respond to their leadership at work. I mean, that's what Paul says in 1 Peter 3, 1. Wives without the word. But by your conversation, that word can mean lifestyle. You might win them without the word. In other words, you live the word. You just be the word. And when you're submitting to that unsaved husband and, and he might be a jerk and he might require dumb stuff out of you and there's a part of you that, that with clenched fists, no, you got to go back to 1 Peter 3, 1 and say, no, 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 Lord. No, Lord, I'm doing this for you. And there have been more than one husband saved through that kind of life of a wife. The same can be true at work. Employee, you might lead your boss to Christ if you start to radically change how you operate it at your place of employment. No more negativity. No more trashing the boss when he leaves the break room or he or she leaves the break room. Right? No more of that nonsense. If you're a Christian, you ought not participate in that. And if that's all that is, then get out of the break room. It does not honor our king at all. We're all created in the image of God. Some of us just don't know it. So let's do well this week. Whether we're the master or the slave, the employer or the employee, 
let's make sure that how we live is honoring to Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this, supervisor, you love people well, they'll, they'll perform better for you. They'll perform better for you. An employee, obey. As unto the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that teaches us how to navigate all the paths that we will walk through on this earth. You've left nothing to chance. You've left nothing to a private interpretation. You have shown us the way. The question is, will we humble ourselves and submit to the authority of your word written by the Holy Spirit through the lives of your men? God, we can radically change this world, but it's not going to be through pitchforks. It's going to be through being ambassadors that your son has called us to be, to love well, serve well, do well. And you will reward that, if not in this life, certainly in the one to come. Be with the Albright family over the loss of a sister. Lord, we pray for them. We ask you to honor them as they honor their sister tomorrow in the funeral. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.